Can you talk a little bit about where where they're staying when they get there to, in Cusco and, and what to expect? Yeah, okay. So th- there are really two main um, places where you'll be housed, depending primarily on how many volunteers are in your group. If you're a smaller group, you're going to be staying on site at our facility where we host kids. Um, and this has changed at times um, during COVID for a lot of reasons. So uh, there have been times when there weren't kids there. So I, I, it's possible always that something could change. But anyway, it these are, um, it's not dorms. It's not a hotel. It's not a home. It is a facility we built for kids to have a home away from home. And within that structure, our rooms for our volunteers. Um, the bathrooms are shared. There are usually at least three people to a room. There are electrical outlets. Um, if you try and blow dry your hair there, you're probably going to cause a short um, because it's not that great of power. But the more painful thing is the hot water situation. So while we have these little hot water heaters on the showers that you, Rocio shows you how to do it, there's a little control at the top. Um, That if you turn the pressure on too much, it won't heat the water enough. So you have to turn the pressure down to more of a trickle to get it hot. So obviously the ideal is to have lots of pressure with hot water you really choose one or the other and this is one of these things that it's just the trade-off you know you're doing something amazing and in exchange you're just not going to have the same comforts of home so you'll still be able to shower we do have flushing toilets all of that but this isn't uh you know this is not a fancy accommodations if you are in a larger group we have a modest uh hotel nearby where everyone stays and uh, actually the water situation isn't very different there either. Um, do remember that actually most people in Peru, particularly in rural areas, take showers with no hot water at all, which is hard to imagine considering that, um, you know, it, for a high at 65 and it's 45 every night, you, you know, people aren't taking baths. There uh, is not a lot of water. As I mentioned, it's an arid culture. Um, the environment just uh while it does rain at times it's just you'll see it's not lush and green um so anyway the accommodations are safe um they're adequate they're nicer than the majority of people in peru have but you won't have the same creature comforts as home we do have wi-fi does it go out on occasion it does um but one thing that cusco has that many of our program locations don't is all over town because because Machu Picchu is the number one um, tourist attraction in all of South America the infrastructure for tourists has really gotten strong around that so every place every cafe every restaurant every bar they all have Wi-Fi and they'll all give you the password so if it's down where we're staying it's really not that hard to go and get access to it also I just sign up with AT&T for an international plan. So when I travel, it's something like, I don't remember, like 10 or $14 a day for unlimited uh, text and phone calls and then a certain amount of data. So I'm not even reliant on the Wi-Fi, um, but it's there. So in terms of accommodations, does that answer cover like bathrooms and all that? Yeah, it does cover. Um, I think also it's important to like know what the kids are there for and their family situations and yeah. that whole context. So most of the kids that are there, well, there's really two groups of kids we're serving. One are the kids that have come from the rural areas where there are no schools. So um, they are their parents will bring them in at the start of the school year and they're getting to stay think of it as a boarding school but it's not a school it's it's the boarding piece where they get to sleep so uh, these kids are coming from um, indigenous families where they don't have uh, they're usually in homes with no foundations they're just on the open earth and they don't have um electricity and running water in most of them so these kids are being sent here by their parents because they want them to have a better life and have education so they're by being here at this center they're able to go to school every day Um, and it's a huge privilege 
but sending them over here, how are they going to eat? Who's going to care for them? And what are they going to do after school? Well, so that's what we're providing is we're making sure that there are meals for breakfast and dinner and you're probably going to be involved in serving and making those and you're going to get to know the kids this way the other population of kids that we're working and you'll see we've also built like a sewing room we've got a construction room where we're teaching kids about carpentry um, you'll see all of those aspects of it but the other uh, population of kids we're serving are also just the local um, impoverished communities uh, because again, remember where people were all coming to get, so the schools that these kids are going to are the ones that had to take in so many extra people when all the extra schools went out of business, all the parochial and private schools went out of business. So all these kids are at the local schools. So when, so during the evening and the morning and uh, afternoon, you'll see the kids um, where they're living. And then during the day, you, we are going and doing the maintenance, construction, and infrastructure improvement for the school where they're actually getting education. Um, so that school is not just kids that are coming from rural areas. They are also kids coming from impoverished neighborhoods right there in Cusco. So you're going to get to meet both sets of those kids. And the kids at the elementary school are between the ages of about... I'm, five or six and 12 or 13. So think of it as an elementary school age. Whereas the facility where you're staying um, has kids up to age about 16. And we have a lot more girls than boys. Um, they tend to be more vulnerable. And, uh, and not just in this community, but in many communities, what happens is the girls will be, uh, so kids will all have some local elementary school that they can walk to not in the rural areas, but in the cities. But then when middle school comes around, they tend to be further and, you know, so they're further apart. You know, they're, it's just like in the United States. There's more elementary schools. They're smaller and they're closer to many neighborhoods. And the middle schools consolidate more people so they're further out. By the time you get to high school, there are even less of them, but there are more kids at that one facility. Well, what happens in uh, countries like Peru, if kids are having to walk further to their middle school so instead of walking a half a mile they're having to walk two or three miles the safety situation for a single 13 year old girl to be walking a lot of families don't they've seen a 13 year old girl get pregnant and they worry that if their 13 year old is allowed to walk that far to school she's going to come back pregnant so they don't let her go to school so uh, and you think well why don't they just walk there their daughters to school well many of these people are working three or four jobs and are barely able to feed themselves it's just a lot to ask they can't do it so uh for that reason it's in many cases the girls who are exceptionally um they're just needing more and so you'll see that there's more girls at this facility and that is why that's one of the reasons why anyway so that's who we're serving